Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Arik Verma from ID Kanpur and we are in the fifth week of the course talking about sentence processing. So in the last lecture we talked about the garden path theory of sentence processing. We talked a little bit about what is actually the premise of the garden path theory which is basically to try and understand how do people choose one or more representations in a, a scenario where more than one grammatical representation is possible, also those representations are all grammatically possible, plausible, acceptable. So that is what we did. We talked about the th three heuristics of late closure, main assertion and uh, uh, minimal attachment, late closure and uh, uh, main assertion. Uh, today we will talk also a little bit more about parsing. We will talk about a different theory of parsing. Uh, a different group of models. So basically we are going to talk about constraint based models of parsing and the constraint based models of parsing are slightly different with respect to the garden path theory, the two step theory that we have talked about earlier. Now we will discuss a little bit about what these constraint based models of parsing are and then we will kind of uh, talk about uh, different constraints that operate uh, in order to kind of inform the parsing procedure. This is almost a uh, a group of theories, not really just one theory, but this is kind of a group of theories, each of which kind of uh, plays, uh, you know, uh, gives a little bit of importance to one of the factors that we will talk about. So without much ado, let us talk about constraint based models of parsing. Now uh, constraint based, based models of parsing constitute the most prominent alternatives to the two stage models, the kind that Lynn Frazier had uh, propounded. And there are some critical differences uh, with respect to these constraint based models of parsing versus the other two stage uh, model, serial models of parsing that were uh, given earlier. Some of these differences are say for example, the constraint based parsers are capable of pursuing multiple structural possibilities simultaneously. If you remember I was telling you in the last class that in the garden path theory or Lynn Fraser's two stage parsing model. Uh, each structure can, so the model is basically being able to evaluate only, come up with only one structure at a time. So it comes up with one structure, evaluates uh, uh, say for example the structure with respect to whether it is thematically integratable or not and if it finds it integratable, semantically plausible, it accepts it. If not, it goes back to the drawing board, creates another structure, checks it again, goes back to the model board, comes again and do, does it iteratively. One of the major, uh, one of the most important differences therefore between constraint based models and garden path model is that these constraint based parsers are able to pursue multiple structural possibilities one at the same time. So these can kind of come up with possibility A, B, C, evaluate all of them in a parallel fashion and then choose the uh, you know, correct one out of there. So that kind of obviously you know contributes to the speed and the efficiency of the parsing process. Uh, second is yes, they adopt a parallel processing architecture borrowing from the McLellan and Rubelhart school of parallel distributed processing. Uh, also these constraint based parsers represent different aspects of the sentences including their syntactic structures as patterns of activations across a large number of interconnected units. So the distribution of the sentences of or the information contained in the sentences is happening uh, much like say for example if you remember we were talking about uh, distributed processing uh, as far as words were concerned. So this is in, in some sense distributed representation of the knowledge that is contained in a sentence in the brain. Further on partial and incomplete information can lead to partial activation of multiple mental representations so that at any given point incoming information uh, you know uh, basically can help you choose even from the other one or so at any given point in the model there are multiple fully active partially active representations uh, that are kind of you know going around in the network. Also the system effectively ranks these structural hypotheses so it is not like each of these multiple hypotheses are all activated at the same level there is a system of ranking as well. So each of these uh, multiple structural hypotheses are sort of effectively ranked with more activation to the more likely ones and less activation to the less likely ones. This kind of uh, you know s helps us uh, organize the number of uh, possible representations in a hierarchical order so as to we know that the most possible uh, representation is the most easily accessible one as well. 
Another implicit assumption in this is that most in most constraint based accounts the syntactic structures do compete with each other for activation similar to what happens in the level of word processing in accounts of lexical access like trace and so on. So, this is almost like trace there are multiple interpretations of a, of a sentence possible all of these multiple interpretations will be differentiatively uh, plausible. So, this is highest possible this is lowest possible this is so on and so forth and they are kind of uh, you know organized in such a way not that they are not competing they are still competing but then they are hierarchical, hierarchically organized in the order of plausibility and it kind of keeps the process efficient and fast at the same time giving you all of that kind of bandwidth in you know uh, evaluating these multiple structures at the same time. Another very critical difference between the garden path theory and the constraint based parsers is that the garden path parser relies solely on word category information. If you remember what was happening in the Lin Frazier's uh, model in the first stage the lexical processor was giving you word category information it was giving you this is a conjunction this is a noun this is a verb this is a determiner this is another noun this is another verb this is a preposition. So, word category information. Uh, the garden path parser was relying only on the word category information for the inputs, but the constraint based parsers can draw on a much wider uh, variety of cues. So, the constraint based parsers not only take word category information into account, but they take all sorts of other information into account as well and it is on the basis of all of this information, it is on the basis of the summation of all of this information that basically you know uh, one gets to decide which structures to build and the relative emphasis on each structure is kind of also organized in that sense. Okay? Uh, so, I, I hope you get it the whole idea is in a very simple sense uh, you have word category information, but you can have context information as well you have uh, you know uh, visual information phonological information you can have so many information on the basis of so many information you can create so many structures and on the basis on say for example, if there are 5 converging evidence on 1 uh, whereas 4 converging evidence only on the second and 3 converging evidence on the 2 you can hierarchically organize this as well this hierarchical organization will be able to help you solve the, uh, uh, this whole competition as to which is the more plausible structure. So, the relative emphasis is also defined by the amount of evidence. We will talk about this in more detail as we move ahead. Now, constraint based parcels are often referred to as one stage models. There is no two stages, there is no lexical processing and thematic interpretation at two stages. All of that is happening one and at the same time. So, uh, so lexical, syntactic and semantic processes are happening all viewed uh, are basically uh, happening simultaneously in these models and uh, as opposed to say for example, lexical processing and thematic processing happening separately in the earlier model. So, this basically is one of the differences if you see with respect to the CBP models from now on I will call them CBP models versus the garden path theory. So, uh, let us kind of look at some of the cues that I was mentioning. The first cue that I can talk about is the effect of context. Now, context as you saw in uh, ambiguous in ambiguous word uh, where we talked about balanced words and ambiguous words and uh, you know uh, uh, biased words and unbiased words and we talked about a neutral context and a biasing context. So, context kind of plays a very important role not only in the interpretation of word meanings, but even more so in the interpretation of how a sentence has to be taken. So, it will be interesting uh, if uh, we do not take context information into account. The earlier model, the two stage model from uh, Lynn Frazier does not really talk so much about context. However, the constraint based models, the CBP models take context as an important source of information. So, let us look at now how context might be affecting somebody's interpretation of particular sentences. What are the context based effects in passing? Let us look at them. Now, uh, as you know, I mean the classic garden path parser only pays attention to word category information it, during its initial attempts to build a syntactic structure. So, only later it will probably take on uh, the other kind of information. Let us take an example uh, the burglar blew up the safe with a rusty lock uh, is the sentence and what you have to do is you have to kind of try and interpret it. Now, when the sentence appears just by itself in isolation the burglar blew up the safe with the rusty lock the listeners have no direct indication as to what could be the meaning of this one. Okay. The article the however strongly implies one safe, the safe with the rusty lock, not a safe with the rusty lock. Okay. It was not that it is not known that there are safes, so many safes and each of the safes are with the rusty lock. So, one of the safes, one of 
uh, a safe with rusty lock is being built. So, the is there, the is saying a particular safe has been blown up. So, that you have to kind of you know keep into mind. Now, moving further, because there is the there, it creates a bit of a challenge for the listener. What is the challenge? In particular, when the listeners or readers uh, get to reading or hearing the rusty lock, they would need to revise some of their semantic assumptions. That is, they have to change from assuming only a single safe to assuming only two safes. Okay? Uh, so, they have to kind of change from, they have to be two safes or at least more than one safe because one of the safes, so basically there could be one or two or three safes the safe with the rusty lock has been blown up while others have been remained intact. So, this is something that uh, the people will need to uh, take into account when they are reading this sentence or hearing this sentence. Okay? Uh, this, these semantic changes, this semantic updation that needs to take place has to be made regardless of whatever syntactic structure you are coming up with. Okay, so, you can, we have not talked about syntactics, we will talk about that uh, 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 moving further, but again kind of uh, trying to explain this to you again. The burglar blew up a safe with the rusty lock is one, there is you know just only one safe and that is being blown, versus the burglar blew up the safe with the rusty lock as if there are many other safes and only that safe which has a rusty lock has been blown up. So, this is what you have to keep in mind. Mentioning the there kind of creates this possibility. So, that is why you have to update your assumptions to assuming that there might be more than one and safes and only the safe which has the rusty lock has been blown up while others have been you know have remained intact. Now, if this is true, how can we make the sentence easier without changing its syntactic structure? How can we make the reading of it easier? One of the ways could be that you provide contextual information. You provide something preceding to that information. So, how will you do it? Say for example, take the example 17 here. The burglar was planning his next job. He knew that the warehouse had two safes. Uh, although one was brand new from the factory, the other one had been sitting out in the rain for 10 years. What did the burglar do? The burglar blew up the safe with the rusty lock. So, the safe which had the rusty lock was blown up. Apparently, the burglar suspected that this old, uh, you know, uh, slightly rusty uh, safe uh, probably should be having all the goods, whereas the newer safe probably does not. Okay. So, intelligent burglar kind of, you know, you have to uh, keep this in mind. Now, according to the garden path theory, sentence 11 should still be difficult to process as regardless of the story, the syntactic structure that you would need for the sentence will be slightly complicated. Let us look at this. What is sentence number 11? Uh, this one, the burglar blew up the safe with the rest of This is sentence number 11. You have to kind of see what kind of syntactic structure we can come up with. Now, this was the garden path interpretation. However, if you look at the context based account, the referential context based account, what does that say? That says, the parser can use the contextual information to decide which syntactic structure it will favor at a given point in time. It will kind of draw from the context and in order to kind of see which contextual information is plausible here and take only that contextual information into account and so it will be easy to read. Okay. In other words, when there is a choice of syntactic structures, build the structure that is most consistent with your current semantic assumptions. If you have a choice of structures, build whichever one follows, allows referring expressions to be unambiguous. So, in case you can come up with multiple structures, you have to follow only this, that structure that kind of allows the other things to become unambiguous. Because the context is allowing this kind of interpretation to be unambiguous, you kind of going to take that syntactic structure. This means that sometimes the parser will build a more complicated structure when a simpler one is licensed by the grammar and consistent with the input. So, even though uh, if you kind of take uh, the assumption where the syntax, I mean uh, uh, the safe with the rusty lock will kind of lead to a more complicated uh, structure, even though it is kind of leading to a more complicated structure, it is still leading to uh, disambiguation, it is still leading to uh, something that kind of goes on with the context and with your semantic assumptions. So, that is why uh, what people will do is in the case of 17, while the readers will need to build a more complicated structure than 11, it will still be easier to process than 11. That is the assumption here. Okay. Let us kind of look into a little bit more detail, I am kind of giving you the theoretical idea. Let us look into a little bit more detail of how the processing is happening here. 
Sentence 11 starts by saying, the burglar blew up the safe. As soon as the listeners get to the safe, they try to figure where, what the safe refers to. What is this safe thing? The context in the mini story that we just introduced in 17 has introduced two safes. A new one that has come out from the factory and an old one that is rusting in the rain. By itself, the safe could refer to either of the two safes. Okay? But the safe is written there because the noun phrase is the safe you kind of interpret. So, if listeners attach the uh, with the rusty lock to the safe, it will create a phrase that is semantically unambiguous. So, you know, because semantically the rusty lock one is kind of uh, the one that is, uh, you know, uh, rotting in the rain, that fits well with the preceding story context as well. And that is why reading of uh, sentence number 17 is easier. You might need to kind of go back and forth here and see what 17 is and what 11 is. So, but you still need to do it if you kind of go back and look at the slide where 17 is mentioned which is here. You see the burglar blew up the safe with the rusty lock. So, if you kind of attach with the rusty lock to the safe, it becomes a more plausible story because the story is already necessitated by the earlier context. You know that although one was brand new from the factory, the other one had been sitting out in the rain for years. So, that kind of very uh, makes this one very easy to follow. Even though 17 obviously will lead to a more complicated structure, there are so many nodes uh, you need to build here. 11, although it will be much more simpler to read, but because there is context and there is that kind of help in 17 and the information is completely unambiguous, that is why we are saying reading 17 by the referential context account is going to be simpler and easier. Let us move further and see what is exactly is happening. If they are going with a simpler syntactic structure, that is the one that they will construct with sentence 11, the safe will remain ambiguous. There is no context. You cannot attach the safe with anything. This could refer to either of the safes produced previously in the story. Okay. So, you do not know which safe are we talking about. Obviously, there is also not no story there. So, referential theory, the context theory predicts that in the case of stories like 17, comprehenders will build the more complicated structure rather than the simpler one like that is possible in sentence 11. As a result, sentence like 11 should be very easy to process despite their complicated syntax uh, when they appear in uh, stories like 17. So, sentence 11 will be easier to read when it is in context with 17. Okay? So, that is, that is the idea. On their own, it will be difficult to read, however. This prediction was confirmed when people's reading times was measured and when sentence 11 appeared by itself, people were slower in reading it as compared to when sentence 11 appeared in the context of the story uh, that was there in 17. People did not slow down when they read the rusty log because the context kind of already made sense uh, for, of the sentence for them. So, Contrary to what the garden path theory predicted, the parser does seem to pay attention to the information that the context makes available at least some of the times in order to make decisions about which syntactic structures you need to build for understanding a new sentence. Okay? Let us move ahead. There is also information about subcategories or subcategory frequency that kind of can be useful in processing in parsing, okay, parsing processing. Uh, what is subcategory? If you remember again from the developmental chapter, we talked about verb subcategory, you know, what kind of uh, information goes with a particular verb. That is what we are going to talk about. Okay. The garden path parser uses only word category information to make initial decisions about which syntactic structures it will initially build. Uh, also, uh, however, basically taking just the word category information. But the words can also provide more information than just about their category. So, that also needs to be uh, understood. Uh, for example, you take these words took and put. Both of these words belong to the same category. Both are verbs. However, uh, both of them have different meanings. So, other than having different meanings, are these two equivalent? Let us look at them. Dr. Phil took or Dr. Phil took a nap. Took is the kind of verb that needs a post-verbal argument. It needs a direct object after it. If you say I took, this next part is a question mark. You have to tell what did I take. So, Dr. Phil took, you have to say took a nap, took a pen, took a ball, whatever. 
okay. So, took is basically something that is called an obligatory transitive. In a different example, let us look at Dr. Phil put, Dr. Phil put a book, Dr. Phil put a book on the shelf. Put basically requires both an object and a goal. It does not only require, it does not only require an object, it also requires a goal to that object. So, I put, what did I put and where did I put it? Both of these things are important. So, if you see not only they are different, took and put, not only they are different in meaning, but they are different in the grammatical requirements that they pose. Took requires, it is an obligatory transitive, it needs an object, there are words that do not, uh, you know, that are intransitive, that do not need. So, I slept, it is all right, I slept on the couch, I can supply that information, okay. But Dr. Phil took needs that information or Dr. Phil put needs both of the information, he put a book in the shelf or uh, you know those those kind of things are there. So, because they are posing different syntactic requirements, they will lead to different syntactic structures being formed. That is the idea. You can take another uh, word. So, Dr. Phil was reading, fine. Dr. Phil was reading a story, also fine. Dr. Phil was reading a little girl, a story also fine. So, we have another kind of example which is which can have multiple subcategories. It can be intransitive, transitive and also ditransitive. So, one of the things that we kind of get out of this discussion is that you instead of only the word category, the kind of word sub, uh, uh, you know the kind of uh, word subcategory is also important. So, you know took, put and reading are all verbs, but what kind of subcategory they belong to? Are they transitive verbs? Are they intransitive verbs? Are they ditransitive verbs? All of that is also required and the knowledge of all of that is going to help you in parsing the sentence that you are reading or listening, okay. So, was reading has a number of subcategory possibilities including intransitive, transitive and ditransitive and each of these subcategory possibilities is associated with a different kind of structure. So, whichever one you take, you will need to create a different syntactic structure to go with it. There are in fact many verbs that are very flexible in this kind of way. So, you need to know this. Now, how does the constraint based uh, theory take this into account? The CBP theory says that the structural information that is associated with each individual word in the lexicon and this information influences the way structural hypotheses will be generated. So, while you are uh, kind of you know categorizing words into these particular categories, you will also know that what kind of structure they come up with, what kind of structure they are permissible to use with and this information will obviously be taken into account when you are generating these so many multiple possible structures. In particular, a CBP parser uh, basically will use subcategory information to determine which kind of structural analysis to favor uh, when more than one structure is consistent with the input, okay. So, let us let us kind of uh, look at this through an example. There is a sentence, okay. The student saw the answer, that is all right. The student saw the answer to the last question, that is also one way of completing this. Now, the uh, structure will become the student is the noun phrase, saw the answer is the verb phrase and within that saw is the verb, the answer is the noun phrase. This is one kind of category, you can kind of draw it into a tree if you want to. The other sentence is the student saw the answer was in the back of the book. So, this is a different kind of a sentence, a different kind of structure will be needed, okay. Now, in this second case, the answer does not represent the direct object of the verb saw because what is basically there because you kind of saw the answer, the answer is kind of so the answer was in the back of the book. So, the answer kind of goes with the next clause, okay. Uh, yeah, so instead the answer is the subject of the verb was uh, and the sentence should be structured uh, as in 29. So, if you look at the how 29 is structured here. The noun phrase is the student, verb phrases saw the answer uh, and then another verb phrases was in the back of the book. Uh, so, the structure, the tree will kind of uh, look very different. So, you can see here 27 can be structured like this, the student saw the answer. So, noun phrase, verb phrase and within the verb phrase there is saw is the main verb and the answer is the noun. In a second uh, uh, possible uh, way of organizing this, you can see it here, the student saw the answer was in the back of the book. So, this is one full sentence complement, it is another uh, sentence, it is sort of this is a combined sentence, this is a whole sentence in itself, the answer was in the back of the book, the student saw is another sentence and they have been combined, 
okay so this one's elements don't really kind of go and mesh with this one's element okay but you need to know you know the the verb category information will basically be uh, able to tell you how to organize this so when the listeners get to the answer in 26 and 27 they face a choice between structures here so 30a and 30b okay 30a is how we uh, organize 27 and 30b is how we organize sentence number 29 now the garden path theory predicts that the people should prefer the left hand structure which is the one with simpler nodes minimal attachments the uh, because it is simpler than the right hand structure as i said and because pursuing the structure allows the comprehender to continue working on the same clause you know working on the same verb phrase so the garden path theory says what it says the sentences like 28 should be harder to understand than sentence like 26 and obviously because sentence 28 is a compound sentence you can say that okay that's true in general but is that true because of the reasons that the gb garden path theory is saying or because of something else the CBP theory actually uh, also says that uh, sentence number 28 should be harder, but it says that that is for a different reason. It turns out that both theories are correct in this instance. Sentence like 28 are actually found to be really harder to read than sentence like 26. That is all right. But what is the underlying mechanism? Let us look at the underlying mechanism. Why is it? Why is reading 28 harder? So, constraint based theory says 26 should be easier than 28 because for the verb saw the parser should predict a direct object so the answer is the direct object the cbp says that parser has to change its mind for sentence complement complement because it's a new instance as soon as it goes here saw it still need to change its mind you know uh, because there's a new complement coming so cbp assumes that people pay attention to the word subcategory preference information so saw the answer and you have to kind of look at what is the verb saw usually coming up with. Is it coming up with direct object or is it coming up with these relative clause like things. Now subcategory preference information reflects the likelihood that a given structure and a given verb will go together. Let us take an example. Consider the verb saw again. Suppose you know that 9 times out of 10 in the past saw was followed by a direct object. Okay. You would know that I saw, I saw a duck, I saw a train, I saw a man, I saw, a, you know, any, anything. So, you know that 9 times out of 10, uh, saw will come up with a direct object. So, when you kind of are reading 28, you are surprised. You have to reassess everything. That is why you will be slower on 28 as compared to 26. That is the CBP explanation. So, the CBP uh, parser says it takes information about the past, how is, how uh, or in what kind of structures has the word saw appeared and what is the likelihood that saw will appear with a direct object or a sentence complement. Sentence complement. Now, the likelihood that again, so because of that calculation, it will get surprised in 28. So, according to the CBP, 28 is hard because the parser predicts a direct object to be coming, but the direct object does not come, a entire sentence complement comes. The student saw the answer was in the back in the book. So, the, the full sentence is coming. That is creating complications here. The student saw the answer, the student saw the duck, the student saw the bat, that would have been much easier. So, when the sentence actually provides the input for a different structure, the constraint based parser has to change its mind. Obviously, when the sentence complement comes in. Okay. So, what did we see? The garden path theory and constraint based theory both make the correct assumption, both say that 28 is harder. But they say it for different reasons. 28 is harder for the garden path theory because it is a more complicated structure. 28 is harder for the CBP theory because the verb subcategory information is violated. So, yeah, you have to kind of understand that. Now, uh, it is again, it is that, uh, you know, uh, in this case, the garden path theory and the CBP were making the identical predictions. But in some cases, they will not make the identical prediction as well. Let us see where. Let us take a difference in tense. Dr. Phil realized his goals early on. It is very similar to 26. Dr. Phil realized his goals were out of reach. It is similar to 28. Dr. Phil realized his goals were out of reach is the sentence complement. GPT, the garden path theory says 32 is harder. CBP, however, says it is equally difficult. Now, very quickly, I will just tell you my guesses and then we will see this in more detail. Dr. Phil realized his goals early on is direct object realize his goals 
you know, realize comes with his direct object, his goals. In 32, Dr. Phil realized his goals were out of reach. That's a sentence compliment. That's goals are not a direct object of realized. Okay. So, obviously, 32 leads to a more complicated structure. Uh, 31 leads to a simpler structure. So, GPT will say 31 is easier to understand, 32 is harder to understand. CBP on the other hand says both 31 and 32 are equal, uh, you know, in difficulty. Let us see how that really happens. According to CBP, 32 and 31 will be similar because the subcategory information in 32 points the readers towards the correct syntactic structure right away. Unlike the verb saw, the verb realized usually is followed by sentence complements. Because uh, realized is usually followed by the sentence complement, there is no surprise or no, uh, you know, there is nothing out of the blue coming in for the readers and that is why they will be reading it with equal, dif uh, equal ease or difficulty as you would say it. 28 was predicted to be harder because the parser could not predict the sentence complement earlier, but here the parser can predict the sentence complement and that is why it is being equally easy. This might be an example for what is called the tuning hypothesis. The tuning hypothesis says the structural ambiguities are resolved on the basis of stored representations or stored records relating to the prevalence of the resolution of comparable ambiguities in the past. Basically, if you have had practice with similar kind of ambiguous structures, you will be able to solve forthcoming or future ambiguous structures on the basis of your knowledge of solving them. It is just practice, you know, very simply. Now, uh, these are two effects. We have talked about context effects. We have talked about, you know, verb subcategory information. Let us talk about one more effect that seems to be useful in parsing. Let us talk about cross-linguistic influences in parsing. See, a lot of us, most of us nowadays are bilinguals, multilinguals, okay. Uh, because we know so many of these languages, because each language has a different set of syntactic rules and structures, uh, it is now increasingly felt plausible and possible that syntactical information from two languages that you know will interact with each other, okay. Suppose I know Hindi and I know English, Hindi syntax will probably affect my reading of English syntax and vice versa. Let us look at this in more detail now. Now, data from cross-linguistic research has shown that sentence processing kind of takes cues from both languages. Now, one aspect of cross-linguistic uh, research, uh, cross-linguistic sentence comprehension research focuses on structural preferences within languages, okay, with respect to structural frequency. So, in particular languages, particular structures are more frequent. Whereas in part, uh, particular other languages, those structures might be less frequent. So, there is structure A, structure B, structure C, language A, language B, language C. Uh, structures A and B could be more frequent in language A, but not frequent in language B or, by, uh, you know, or you can kind of create so many of these combinations. Okay. So, let us kind of try and understand this in uh, with the help of this example. Sentence 33, shot the female servant of the actress who was standing on the balcony with her spouse. Someone shot the servant of the actress who was standing on the balcony with her spouse. Okay. In the first, there is this sense of, uh, you know, you say male, female servant. In the second, you express, you know, male uh, servant. Okay. And that kind of uh, spouse uh, can be male or female, uh, you know, uh, is basically male in both uh, cases because her spouse is there. The spouse will be male. Let's read it again. Someone shot we are talking about female, someone shot the female servant of the actress who was standing on the balcony with her spouse, female servant of the actress who was standing in the balcony with her spouse, someone shot the male servant of the, bal uh, of the actress who was standing on the balcony with her spouse, okay. Now, if you again uh, go back and read sentence 33, which is the first sentence, you will find that it is globally ambiguous because who was standing in the balcony with her husband could apply to both the female servant and the actress. In sentence 34, it is just temporarily ambiguous because as soon as you read the entire sentence, you will know that the relative clause in basically will apply to the second one, the actress. Also, you will know that the relative clause in English uh, would be tied to the second of the two nouns. So, the, it is basically observed that in English, the relative clause is basically tied to the more recent or the second one. Okay, But Spanish and French speakers, they prefer attaching the relative clause to the first noun. So, basically what is happening is if you are a, uh, you know, if you are a French or a Spanish reader and you are reading this in English, you will want to attach the relative clause to the first noun 
to the servant and then because uh, initial one the servant is kind of also uh, because the servant is female it can also take up this that will create to an ambiguity and the first one to the spouse can actually not be attached to the servant because that is a male servant that will kind of lead to a problem ok. So, attachment to the first uh, noun appears to uh, be the more frequent option in Spanish and French but not a very frequent option in English. Experimental outcomes people have done these experiments with sentences th 33 and 34 and they appear to support the idea that more frequent structures appear to be the easier to process. So, for a reader for him attaching to the first clause is more frequent they will uh, basically find that kind of organization easier for those readers uh, where uh, attaching to the second clause is more frequent they will kind of uh, find it easier processing according to that ok. It confirms the CBP assumption that people do keep track of how often they encounter uh, particular kinds of sentences. You know the whole knowledge of frequency basically comes from number of times you have come across these kind of sentences. So, if you have come across uh, a particular kind of sentences many a times and you have applied the same solution atta attaching to the first or attaching to the second clause and that solution has worked, it kind of gives you a sense of practice and uh, as long as the uh, you know the practice can be applied to a new sentence it gives you the sense of you know frequency you know it gives you a sense of okay this is how this works I am happy with it. However, uh, it has been shown that not only frequency but there could be other factors that could decide where you are going to attach the relative clause to those factors can also be factored in into your representation or choice of the structure. Two such factors are animacy and concreteness. Let us see. So, Brisbert's group, Mark Brisbert, uh, you know, they this this kind of uh, uh, analysis and what they said that there is this fine grained information, animacy, concreteness, etc., which will kind of figure in along with the information about structural frequencies. So, Brisbert and Don Mitchell, they measured Dutch uh, speakers' eye movements while they were reading Dutch equivalents of sentences 33 and 34. The eye movements indicated that the Dutch speakers had more trouble interpreting the test sentences when the relative clause went with the first noun than when it went with the second noun. But when uh, researchers looked at the database of Dutch sentences, they found that the relative clause went with the first noun more often than when they went with the second. So, this is kind of counterintuitive. If by frequency, uh, usually the uh, relative clause goes with the first noun, so the participants should find it easier. But in this case, you are seeing that the participants are not finding it easier. I am repeating, the eye movements indicated that the Dutch speakers had more trouble interpreting the sentences when the relative clause went with the first noun as compared to when the relative clause went with the second noun. By frequency estimates, researchers found that in Dutch, the relative clause goes more often with the first noun and less often with the second noun. So, by the frequency uh, idea, it should have been perfectly easy to read. However, it is not the case. Why so? Let us wonder about that. So, the more frequent structure appeared to be more difficult to process contrary to what the CBP and other frequency dependent parsing accounts would suggest. However, when you look in more closely, when researchers looked in more closely and they analyzed the test sentences and the sentences from the database, they found that semantic factors like animacy and concreteness were actually playing a part. So, those playing uh, a part even more important than the position in determining in, uh, than frequency in determining where the modifying relative clauses will be attached to. So, what basically happens is when more fine grained information is taken into account, reading times could be better predicted than just taking into account the structural frequencies. How did the parser decide whether something is frequent or infrequent? If we just count all the sentences in simple active voice sentences basically will be the more frequent. The parser should therefore favor the direct object interpretation of any sentence that starts with a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So, typically you are assuming that the parser is accumulating all of this knowledge, it kind of gets to the point that ok, uh, these are direct interpretations, uh, I mean obviously active sentences are much more uh, frequent as compared to passive sentences. So, every time an active sentence comes, processing should be faster, every time a passive sentence comes, processing should be relatively slower. Is that really the case? Let us look. But if you start uh, counting up structures which go with an individual verb, then the parser should favor the sentence complement interpretation of any sentence uh, that starts with the noun phrase followed by the verb other noun. So, basically what will happen here is 
that uh, you will kind of start favoring structures wherein there is another sentence complement. Say for example, uh, realize followed by another noun is more plausible here. Or if you start counting up the likelihood of specific verb noun combinations, you know verb subcategory information, uh, then the parser should switch back to favoring the direct object interpretation of any sentence that starts with a noun, uh, say for example, the verb realize and the noun goals. So they could kind of go back to that. However, if you start factoring in animacy, then any sentence that starts with an inanimate noun should reduce the likelihood of a simple active structure. because simple active structures do not start with inanimate nouns okay so this problem is referred to as the grain size uh, problem what is it that you're attaching to what and in what manner so you have to kind of take that into account now the grain grain size problem kind of says that languages offer multiple levels of analysis and people can potentially keep track of this uh, statistics at any level of analysis. So they will know at the level of sentence structure, they will know at the level of verbs, they will know at the level of which uh, noun goes with which verb, all of that. Okay. And the degree to which a structural alternative is preferred can differ at different grains. So at one level of analysis, this uh, interpretation seems plausible. At another level of analysis, this uh, structure seems uh, prominent. And, and another level of structure, the other structure can uh, seem prominent. Okay. Now, how do you kind of get around this mesh? You know, how do you solve which is the correct way? Okay. A possible solution that they offer is that the parser should not keep any statistics at all. It does not keep any frequency information at all, as the two stage models say. Another solution, however, could be that the parser keeps track at different grains and combines data from different games to come at a summed or a weighed estimate of what is the most probable structure. Okay. Say for example, at the sentence level of analysis, this is the most probable structure. At the animacy level of analysis, this is the most probable structure. What I can do is easily average the two and compare the average of other two and other two with each of them and the one which gives me the highest likelihood of correctness is the one that I will choose and go with. So, in our example involving realized, yeah, Dr. Phil realized his goals early on versus Dr. Phil realized his goals were out of reach. So, in our example involving the world realized, the parser will give some weight to the fact that the most common structure in the language is subject, verb, object. It will also give some weight to the fact that the most likely structure for any sentence with the verb realize is the one having the sentence complement and not the one having direct object. But if it gets the verb realized followed by goals, the parser will pay also attention to the fact that at this very fine grain, goals is really a good direct object for realized. Dr. Phil realized or Ram or something uh, would not really f uh, fit there because that's an inanimate thing. Goals is inanimate kind of fits very well with realized. Okay. And will therefore the boost the activation of the syntactic structure that goes with that interpretation. So at three levels you are seeing. One level, the subject verb object is there. The other level, you know that, uh, you know, after realize, you should expect a sentence complement. And the other level, you'll also know that, okay, realized is being followed by goals. Re goals are a good object for realized. If it were an animate thing, that would not be a good object for the verb realized and it will create problems. So, on the combination of all three of these possible interpretations is when you understand this is the one that I need to boost the activation of and finally select. So I hope this was not very complicated. I'm sure I'm saying again, you have to kind of, you know, go over this again and again a little bit to understand. Uh, but this is, uh, we still kind of uh, will be talking about some of the other uh, factors in constraint-based passing models in the next class. I hope this is making some sense. Thank you.